Susan, again from World Peaceful. I hope you're having a beautiful day. I felt inspired to communicate to the world as I am doing, as my contribution. This is coming from gross national happiness, which profits others. This is my way of living a new social economic paradigm. So what I'm going to do today is read from a blog to share with you another way of seeing the world. I know many are feeling overwhelmed by the way the world is and they feel they have no power. We all have the power to choose and we have the power of creativity and the power of love. That's where your power is. So this blog is called We Are Stewards Not Owners of the Planet. I woke up this morning with the feeling we are stewards, not owners of the planet. As my spirit is in the ascendancy of my life and my ego starts to recede, that is separation consciousness is seen for what it is, illusionary. I feel myself seeing the world differently. I see no traditional owners or property owners as how can one own a planet that is 4 billion years old? Imagine that, 4 billion years old. I'm only 53. How can I know the world? I think the planet has a much deeper understanding of what it is. We, like the millions of other life forms on this planet, are here temporarily. In truth, we own nothing, as nature doesn't sell itself. Nature is life and offered for free. This is the beginning of free dom. That is free dominion when you begin to see you need to own nothing. As the word, as the world and the word <laughs> is within you. These are interesting notions in a world that believes you have to earn the right to have rather than be born and life is abundant. The false restrictions on the money system is what creates within humans the false notion that there is not enough. In truth, the world has abundance for everyone. The emergence of the economic system came from the barter exchange of goods and services. This was the natural inclination of people to exchange with each other to reflect changing preferences. Money came in as a system of exchange to make such transactions more universal. Interestingly enough, as soon as money came in and the simple notion of accumulation of money became rooted in the human psyche, greed was born. Humans by nature are giving the emotional aspect and bonding of humanity is the true nature that gives. When we moved into the money system, the focus of this system was to accumulate more money so a person could get more interesting things and have influence. As the world opened up through trade and more cultures were visited, more material items were desired. The exotic silk route with the carpets, clothes, ornaments, trinkets, gold, jewellery and what came to be seen as riches haunted the hearts of people. As they found themselves wanting more, it also became an extension of self-worth as people were impressed by what was seen and they were able to buy or trade influence, corruption was born. Other words for this are inequality and unfairness. We no longer shared equally with the group. We started to take more for ourselves and the ego of humankind dominated. It evoked increased selfishness as we disconnected from the tribal culture which saw itself as one family. What is the ego? I recommend you have a look at um, Eckhart Tolle, A New Earth. 
He talks about the ego and he talks about grievances. It'll give you a really good feel for what has actually happened. But let's just go with this blog for the moment. So what is the ego? It is known as a separated state of consciousness in some quarters. It is the aspect of the human psyche that feels emotional pain, becomes offended, gets what it wants, demands respect, dominates others, wants to feel special, desires status, and I'll put in brackets better than, is proud of itself, and the list goes on. It is a separated consciousness as it only sees its own needs. They are separate from others. As one takes, it doesn't occur that another has less. Another way of seeing this is humanity living in a context of duality or the oscillation between positive and negative emotions. So the duality is sort of, you know, two, two separate points. We oscillate between the fear and the love. This is why we're up and down. Because in each moment we're choosing on the basis of our knowledge, our awareness, our desires, our education. We're making preferences. I want this. I want that. I got this. I didn't get that. I'm happy. I'm sad. So we're constantly flicking between our, you know, these needs and wants, but on the basis of an emotional array that's being triggered. When in the negative... The person is in the ego, and I'm, I'm actually changing the blog here as I'm reading it, even though it's mine, <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> there is actually ego which is positive and negative ego, because what I've written here is when positive or loving we move into the spiritual nature. I'm going to actually explain that, because when I wrote that I didn't have the awareness I have now. Ego is part of the human condition. We are in a world where we have come into it on the basis of a sort of a context, if you like, where there's fear and there's love. And it's created all sorts of dramas on the planet. Because we're believing that we are dependent on the system, a lot of fears come up when things get threatened. This is the ego. The ego can be that I'm better than you and I feel great, you know, I feel terrific, you know, I've got all, I've got everything I need. Look at you. <laughs> you failed and you're a loser. We can judge. That's egoic. Now to move beyond the ego is actually selflessness. And it's not self-depreciating or anything like that or holier than thou, you know, or more humble than the other. The minute we step into some sense of separation, I'm a this and you're a that, that's the ego. So it can happen on the positive and the negative. The spiritual nature, in truth, comes in through silence. There is no thought associated with the spiritual nature in truth. There is a feeling, though, and I know in, I can only talk from my own experience when it, when it comes to me, and I'm not always in this space. I obviously am like everyone else. <laughs> when I'm feeling great love and when I feel really happy, happy where I am, and I might have nothing, and I'm, I am a person who has lived uh, technically what you'd call poverty, um, although I see it as I don't actually mind living uh, with not many material things. I think I have too much already. But the reason I'm living in this way is there's more freedom in it, in actual fact. So it's not to feel sorry for my situation. But from that perspective, I've been really amazed at how happy I've been in moments not having what others have, not having a house, for example, you know, not having a family, you know, not having a lover to tell me how great I am. <laughs> I have to find it within myself <laughs> to see the greatness within, which is in within, within everyone. I've often talked in my blogs about being a clown 
and how that gave me the opportunity to see the beauty in everyone. It was a perspective. But because I wasn't thinking as I was doing it, I was able to access what I would call, um, if there are any other words, I will search for them, but let's just say a spiritual reality. In other words, the rich abundance I felt was in the spirit of things. It was in the fun and the laughter, in the play. That is the joining with, if you like, a spiritual reality. So I just have used that as a bit of an interlude because I'm just seeing some errors in the blog now from this perspective looking back because this was written quite a few years. It was written about seven years ago, I think. So let's go back to the blog. Let's just say the love aspect, the truth aspect, when it's not depreciating, is the spiritual experience. You just naturally will speak the truth. You're, you're, in other words, what that's really saying is you're transparent to the world. You're not putting on a facade or a face to impress. Even though I'm wearing makeup, <laughs> let's just say <laughs> I'm still working that through. I've always, always done it. But that, I guess that's a little bit of a mask too. So, you know, I just accept my own, uh, you know, let's just say I'm still working on it. That's the best way I could put that, I think. Okay, so back to this. So no particular person I'm saying here is spiritual. We all are, as we identify with the higher self in moments. That always seeks to return to unity. When you love, give, feel empathy, join with life, feel peace, express joy, work together, these are expressions of the spirit in ascendancy. You lose that sense of separation and start to join with everyone seeing all as family and the planet as one. So once we get past the duality, we really start to see that, like the work I'm doing, it's not really work. I'm just feeling inspired to do what I do. That is my highest joy. It's not always easy, but it is my highest joy because I know I'm in service to others. And, in, and service isn't just making them all feel good. Sometimes you can, you can be a challenging voice in the room but what the other may not know is that that's actually coming from love because sometimes in order to break out of our own illusions, we have to be confronted with what we fear. And that includes me too. <laughs> We're all in this together. So returning to the economic system, the focus here is profit maximisation and the status that is accorded when a person is successful. The ego is massaged by others. And the person feels distinct from the crowd, a winner. <laughs> Interestingly, it is an illusion, as no person is greater or lesser than another. We are accorded the same value when born, and one's journey through life is to experience a dimension of life. Who is to say the person experiencing poverty is lesser than the rich person experiencing abundance? I'll say wealth, actually, because the term abundance is actually a much broader perspective. You can be abundant and have nothing. I feel incredibly abundant and I get really excited when, you know, things happen. Like let's say I've got no money and someone gives me $50. Yeah, I oh know it seems, seems, you get excited about that. Yes, you do. When you're trusting life, you just go, wow, look at that. It came to me. Now I can go and buy some food. That's abundance. I've felt that too when I've travelled and I've had a bed somewhere to sleep. I've just gone, wow, I can't believe how this happened. You know, someone came along and offered me a place to stay. And the joy is the abundance. See, actually abundance has joy in it. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's distinct from wealth where you're just earning lots of money. You lose after a time, it goes into your bank account, and you lose that sense of joy that life has brought you this. You've earned it. You've worked hard for it. You deserve it. <laughs> That's the mantra. <laughs> anyway, just thought I'd say that. One may find they learn the importance of sharing, caring, and having enough to eat. The wealthy one may find themselves alone in their wealth, feeling they can have anything but no authentic relationships that love them for them rather than the money. They may not be feeling the aliveness in life as they come to play a role 
which becomes a tourniquet as it's not truly them. They are being seen to be, it becomes a spiritual poverty lacking in love. That is why it is true to say that wealth cannot buy you happiness. Life is about challenges and ups and downs. Many may try to have the good life to avoid the contrasts. Yet it is through contrast that we grow and come to know who we truly are. In truth, you cannot avoid life, but you can choose to learn from it. The profound words to thine self be true is spirit in ascendancy. As you are true to yourself, you can be true to others. You begin to see through your own illusions, which may place you in moments of judgment or superiority. When you are true to yourself, that is, commencing an inner inquiry into your beliefs, you start to see slowly what you believed. If negative, it was untrue. So when you are true to yourself, you give yourself permission to to feel, to free <laughs> yourself from beliefs, which, if negative, separate you from the greater spirit or self of humanity. The poor African is not less than the wealthy tycoon. The child is not less than the parent. The woman is not less than the man. The person who does, in the eyes of society, nothing, is no less than the person who appears to do everything. We are being, doing what we choose and it reflects choices and beliefs, not personal value. I might just add to that because the way that sentence was constructed, we are being. I want to emphasise that. See, I have the luxury, and it is a luxury, to pretty much do what I'm choosing right now. Now, others can come at me from a perspective and say, you're not working, you have no status. You don't even have a house. You have no support. Oh, my goodness, I'd hate to be in your life. <laughs> but I would say back to that, I have freedom. I can choose when I get up. I can choose when I go to sleep. I can choose what I do with my day. Now, obviously, there's a trade-off with these things. For me, the money has been the trade-off. But because I'm interested in abundance, not wealth, and I made that decision when I was 29. I decided to go for the experience, not the money. I made a really clear decision because I was offered more money. I was working as a market analyst at the time. And I chose to go on an adventure instead. That's when I moved to England. So what has become more anchored <clears throat> in my life has been being, which is to be who I am. Now, living alone, people can say, Oh, you haven't found anyone. <laughs> That's not true. I'm not seeking anyone. Of course, there are moments when it would be beautiful to have someone to share things with, of course. But I have made choices to get to know who I am, to thine own self be true, as I mentioned. I can't see who I am if there's another around me and I can be easily influenced by that other through their beliefs and expectations of what I should be, particularly being a female. Get a job, you know. What are you doing with your day? You know, I can't support you. These sorts of things would come up. Better to be alone. I find all I really need is basics to be covered, you know, just a roof. And even then I've got a tent, so even that's not necessary and just have basic food so I can eat because really the abundance from which I come is my creativity my inspiration all the poetry I write these videos that I'm producing I'm creating a space for this to happen and I can't do it if I'm busy that's why I'm doing it I'm doing it for you because you don't have time to do this now you might look at me and go that's a you know, a notion I don't agree with. Well, you're not in my shoes and you haven't given it the time yet. And you may, and, and that's not to say you're wrong either. See, this is how I come back to fairness. 
you have to choose for you. All I'm really doing with this work here is giving you an insight into my life as an example of what's possible. You don't have to agree with me, and I would expect in a democratic system that your thoughts are your own. You do what you feel is right for you. And if you're here listening to me now, who knows, maybe maybe there's something in this for you and you'll know it because you'll feel resonance. You'll keep listening. If you don't, that's fine. It means this is not your path. This is for those, really my work is for those who really want to come back to who they are. This is for those who don't feel, you know, life in its current configuration expresses who they are. This is really for those <clears throat> pioneers who want to co-create something new. That's what this work is offering. I've written many, many blogs, over 2,000 in this particular blog, because I'm exploring. I'm exploring the possibilities. I'm using my own life to tap into where can we go? Who will we become? And my intent is I want all to be happy. My intent is a future that's predominantly happy. Now, it doesn't mean it's perfect that you're always happy. You won't be. There'll be times when things disappoint and that's part of life. That's normal. We can't all be cheerful. There'll be times when you don't want to be here and that's okay too. Because from that point of not wanting to be here, you make choices. And I say to those who are thinking those thoughts, just wait. It's, it's okay to not want to be here, but just stay for a while, to stay for a while. I know I don't regret staying. Each day, I just work it out each day, you know. But, you know, whatever happens, happens. It's part of the experience of living, of being. It makes you deeper. So in some respects, um, or in many respects, suffering is actually a portal, if you like, to higher joy because it makes you face the things that have brought unhappiness into your reality. All of us want to go out of unhappiness and find happiness. But the unhappiness is there because we're out of alignment with who we truly are. So returning back to this paragraph beginning, which is to thine own self be true, is, is why we suffer. You have to be prepared to face what you fear, and that's one of the challenges at this current time. So I'll read on back to economics because I'm oscillating between these, these philosophical insights to economics because this is the predominant issue we're dealing with right now. The economic system is a choice of how to distribute physical materials. It seems likely to me the system emerged from poverty. The rise of wealth in Caucasian cultures may be related to coming from colder climates where food was scarce. The darker people had more abundance as in food as many lived in the equatorial zones. Now, this was taught to me by an ex-partner, actually, my ex-husband. I thought it was a very wise insight. So those of the Caucasian, the pink, I call this pink skin, <laughs> not white, <laughs> we're in colder climates and that's why we're more aggressive. We had to fight harder for food. Those gentle souls in the equatorial parts or where food was abundant typically were far more relaxed and you know, out in the sun, you know. They had access to food so they didn't have to fight so hard for it. However, over time, the weaknesses in the system or the weakness in the system is that it moves us away from our true nature. It does not encourage sharing, caring, revealing or healing which I've put in brackets as love. It fosters separation through fear of loss, not enough, wanting more, competition, status, superiority, success, and so on. We are witnessing the demise of the economic system around the world as it is truly not sustainable. It has created great misery on the planet and gives more substance to the notion by Edmund Burke the only thing necessary for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. That's men or women. 
This, in my view, refers to the disempowerment of people through systems of government that do nothing. Oh, I see what I, I've just made a slight mistake. I'll reread that. This, in my view, refers to the disempowerment of people through systems of government that do not represent them, same thing, <laughs> or give them a true voice. I'm joking, of course. Systems of work which dominate, dominate and use their energy rather than collaborate for a greater good. Now, I just want to examine that for a second because I may have confused it. So we're really talking about um, people being disempowered through government systems. They're disempowered because they keep get, they are receiving things. Now, people could say that's the welfare state. There has to be a safety net in a civilised society. I hear words like entitlement, and I know that those do not come from this country. This entitlement attitude, in fact, those who are saying entitlement are the ones who have entitlement. <laughs> They believe they're entitled to the best jobs. You know, they, the doors are opening for them. But they say that those on welfare are entitled, you know, that they, they're they just sitting there dependent on the system. Well, yeah, there's truth in that, but they're also in great need too. So you have to find ways to empower them without force, you know. And they haven't done that very successfully at this point. Then I go on to speak about the systems of work which dominate and use people's energy rather than collaborating for a greater good. So this is where people feel, in a sense, in hierarchies where they have no say. They try and you know, map out career paths so they have more respect, more status, more money. But ultimately, their energies get used. I mean, you think of all the hours you put into work. It's a lot of people working really hard. They have no time for their kids. They're too tired when they come home. They might even bring work home at night or for the weekend. They might do two jobs. So this is your physical energy being used. And this is why, and I'm just going to a bit of an aside here, artificial intelligence is being touted. They actually want to re remove all that because it's too hard. <laughs> Better to get robots in and do all the work and you, you can all eat cake. <laughs> that's what I see. I could be wrong, but that's what I see. I see that it just purely as self-interested what's going on. And that's interesting. And that's because those who are thinking in this way have no connection, you know, to the other. And that's what I talked about earlier, even, even in respect of wealth. You can be very lonely with piles of money if you don't know how to connect to people. And if you're caught up in, you know, hierarchies and false status, you're going to think you're superior and you won't want to associate with some, even though that other could be probably your best friend. That other could be the very thing that you need to connect with in order to know who you are, because that's your job here, to thine own self be true. The goal of this life is not about making money, although it's an experience, but it's not the whole life. So going back to this, we have created dependent populations on systems of work. That's the same as welfare, by the way. You're just getting more money and you're having to work for it. Governance and resource distribution, which in the event of a collapse, do not know how to survive. So everyone's actually dependent. It's a bit like an umbilical cord. We're all, and we, we, we shut ourselves down because we don't want to lose that income because we don't think we can survive without it. We've become dependent. So when this collapses, how do we survive is a big question. We don't even know how to, you know, really go out and fend for ourselves if we ever found ourselves out in the bush. Most of us wouldn't wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> That's how dependent we are. We're domesticated. I go on to say they have low resilience adaptation. That is not to say the knowledge is not out there. It is. But for high proportions of people, they have no clue how to grow vegetables and build a house. I include myself in that group. <laughs> you know, clown. I, I might be able to make everyone laugh as <laughs> they starve to death. But <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I don't know. What can I offer? Just say, don't panic. I'm into peas. <laughs> what I found interesting in my experience of this system 
was the task-oriented nature of it. I saw a documentary the other day on the world of work. The person was followed through their day. They found it hard to get up at 7 a.m. I can relate to that. They are not choosing naturally to get up. They are forced if they want money. This is the first addiction that moves us. Then he goes to the office and sees the same faces. No one says good morning. He takes his place at the workstation next to the other guy. He then tries to look busy. He gets a little joy in flirting with the female colleague. Sexual harassment. Oh, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> you can flirt. It's okay. You can flirt. Um, <clears throat> where was I? <laughs> just distracted myself away from that. So he, he has a little bit of a flirt with the, the girl. He tries to invent ways to speed up the day, walking around the office looking productive. He finds himself endlessly waiting for the clock. It's actually watching the clock. Mapping his day by morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea to try and make it go faster. When I watched this film, I smiled and I'm smiling now <laughs> as I knew the reality <laughs> intimately. And in fact, as I was reading that, I was remembering all the companies I've worked in. Of having worked in up to 400 companies myself, I used to yawn so much. I had tears in my eyes and for me, getting up was really hard. I'm a night person. I would go to work, grab a coffee, then go into the toilet and try and get away from the computer. <laughs> Time to think for myself. I would have conversations to just kill off the monotony. <laughs> I was not interested in what I was doing at all. But I was told I have to work to make money. I found myself in a system where I have to pay for where I live, buy food, buy clothes, enticements all around me to buy more. Marketing, of course, is the mover of all goods and services and oils the system globally. I'm a market analyst, I knew this, <laughs> I was trained in marketing. The creation of demand. Now, this is not, I just want to interlude here. I'm also an economist. The economic system was really about price signals set by demand and supply. Companies supply it, you demand it. There's a price, they call it an optimal price that's set. It's where, it's where demand and supply intersect. So in, the, in that cross that you can see, price would be set. So we'd have this as P and this is or D supply so where it intersects now obviously the tension here is business organizations want to produce more because they want to make more more widgets is what we used to call it so they need to market to you to get to buy more and more and more but there's a problem in this and this is why this blog was created you have to have the resources to supply so the greed inherent in profit maximising, I need more, 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 and status also um, is an aspect of this. Look at my house and my beautiful things and look at my clothes and I'm a person of power and doors open for me but not you. <laughs> you stay down there. And that's how the game's played out, you know, the class system. And I do laugh because I see the game in it. I know it's not true, of course, in the sense that nobody's superior to anybody. But however, the system is set up to market to you so you will buy more. So I go on to say that's the creation of demand. And this will be advertising and what have you. Without manufacturing false desires and communicating wants as needs, humans would return to a more simple life naturally. I was trained in marketing, so learned about how to communicate through advertising to make people feel somewhat deficient is the name of the game, that the product or service will fill that gap, somehow make them stand out, etc. The more they buy, the more wealth is generated. All of this is recorded as GDP, in our case, gross domestic product. In other countries, it's gross national product. So this is the aggregation, if you like, or counting up of all those products and services that have been purchased. And the government sends out signals of keeping us consuming. 
it keeps us all working and the system goes around and around. And, of course, government is now entering trade much more. Now it's it's in the configuration of a corporate. And that's that's problematic because now it's its allegiances change because now it's serving profit maximising as distinct from serving the people as its primary focus. So I've just actually scrolled down a little bit on this and I'm just scrolling right back <laughs> up to see. It's actually quite a long vlog, really. Ah, oh, yes, I'm actually giving you a lot of information here. So going back to marketing and economics, GDP, I go on to say that this is what keeps the system going, okay, round and round. It's fascinating to watch the traffic snaking its way into the city. When I lived in Brisbane, I'd watch from my balcony, sometimes at 4am or 5am in the morning, through the mists, mist, the endless lights of cars going to work. I wondered at their lives. The problem with the working scenario and the need to work as a means of survival is that it conflicts with the true situation that we are born free into a free world. Human beings feel the pull towards their nature to follow their own rhythm. Yet through the social norms, education and structure of the economic system, we have created winners and losers. The losers don't have jobs and are seen as failures. They do experience impacts on their social standing and whether they are invited to dinner or not. So anyone opting out of the system is socially ostracised in subtle ways rather than respected as a sovereign person making a choice. That certainly happened to me. But I, I can honestly say I don't mind. Um, I'm not actually choosing the social life. I'm choosing to work out of my inspiration. So for me, I have a very fulfilling life and I don't need people so much. It's nice to be around them and I often will go into a cafe and do my work there because I like the feeling of people around me. But I actually don't, I don't really need people. I only have a few really strong, good friendships, you know, and really that's it. That's fulfilling to me. I remember I was working for myself as a manager in an independent research company. Money went from boom to bust in my work, so sometimes I'd be going on welfare. What I noticed once was I went to a meeting with a green energy company and was treated with respect as I was a manager and perceived as well-educated, one of us. Then I went down to welfare and joined the queue. <laughs> I noticed the difference in how I felt and perceptions. Yet in truth, I was unchanged. I find that fascinating, the power of social norms and perceptions, how untrue they really are. You have to smile. Another experience I had when I went on welfare, I had been teaching at a TAFE college and my partner had to go to Canada to care for his mother dying of cancer. After paying his ticket, I had no money for myself. So I went and lined up. One of my students was in the group who came together to talk about benefits. She was shocked to see me unemployed. <laughs> I was slightly embarrassed, but not much, to be honest. Over the years, I've been on and off welfare, but I feel no social stigma at all now as I fully accept it and I am grateful for it, or I was, I'll tell you a bit in a minute. It was given me, the, it, it has given me the opportunity to be with those who are not the economic winners and I'm able to see the other members of my community from different countries, single mothers, youth, elderly and so on. I have no ego attachment at all to status now. I actually look forward to going and meeting the people. Now, that's when I was on Centrelink, <clears throat> which is what we call it in Australia. Today, I've, I'm actually a conscientious objector. Um, after watching the 7.30 report, which is an ABC program, who were outlining rorting uh, by the Job Services Network, which is a privatisation of welfare here in Australia. Essentially, they've set up contract type systems where private companies get a job seeker onto a contract and their contract with the job seeker and the government is to facilitate, you know, employment opportunities. 
There's also training involved to some degree and there's also programs which are controversial like work for the dog, which is working for nothing. It's an interesting one. And there are obviously benefits in respect of training that can happen and so forth and so on. But for myself, when I heard of the rotting in the system and the fact that the companies were still trading, they were still in contract to the government, there had been no repercussions given that they had falsified job seeker records in order to make more money was what happened. Now, I wrote to the government and I explained that I was a conscientious objector and also it raised questions of the Constitution, Section 51, Subsection 23A, I believe it is, which is the obligation of government to provide uh, income support for people in a whole various ways, disability, unemployment, age pension, I think. Now, what was interesting to me was how was it that you can be cut off um, a situation like this, cut off welfare, by objecting to corruption in the system? And I haven't had that question answered yet, and I've still chosen to allow life to carry me is why I'm putting it. I really feel strongly about not going on. I don't wish to participate in something, and that's my vote that I think is unfair. So why should a private company maintain a contract when it's been found to be rorting, falsifying information? And yet if a job recipient, a job search person, unemployed person, if you like, breaches by non-compliance, in that system, they're cut off from life support. That's what my objection is. Now, the company is not going to be languishing in poverty when it loses its contract, but the person who is dependent on that income, just as someone from a job would be, they end up in serious poverty, which is what happened to me. Although because I have a spiritual reality, I'm actually not panicking about it. I'm testing it. So I'm just letting you know that part because my circumstance did change and I was talking about welfare then. So moving ahead with that. My life has become a journey, not a statement of success. I see success now in terms of self-determination, being true to myself, living from my own rhythm. As I return to what is natural, I return home. This means letting go of attachment and perceived self-worth through external influences. I become my own self-worth by learning to love not only myself but others. I need nothing from others to feel good about myself. So in truth, no one owns anything. It is a system set up by humans that says we all agree that when we pass these notes or coins and call it money, it means you can have something in exchange. It was originally not about social division and better or less, hence class status. It was simply to exchange items as an efficient means of sharing diversity. If you do not have notes and coins, you have no right to it. You do not own it. The key word in the sentence is rights, uh, um, property rights, through the money system created notions of poverty and wealth. These are notions. It also created crime as anyone stealing what wasn't theirs was a thief, even if that item was bread, as they were hungry. The system of property rights was clearly unnatural as nature distributes equally. Nothing is excluded from nature's bounty unless there are natural changes such as drought or flood, etc. Rights means I cannot walk into a paddock as it is owned by someone. That per person may have the right to shoot me for trespassing. Let's hope they don't. <laughs> I cannot sit at a table in a shop. I must purchase something. I have no right to the freedom of movement to simply move across my planet. If I wish to travel to places across the ocean, I have to have documents that give me permission to travel as the notion of nation state is born from conquest and ethnicity. 
so your ethnic group. So human beings divide the planet into nation states and name them. People identify with the name and can be induced to fight for, the, for their nation. In truth, they do not own the land. The land is 4 billion years old. We live to 80 years old on average, some less. If we are the winners in the first world, perhaps uh, that we live to 80, that is, perhaps 40 to 50 in the third world. Thus, we divide and restrict what was naturally abundant and free. The restriction of human beings can distort behaviours. As we are restricted, we feel subconsciously or consciously a sense of not enough when we feel that. We feel what we want more or resent those with more. Some even admire those with more thinking. They are smarter. <laughs> I like the way I read that sentence. Some even admire those with more thinking they are smarter. I've heard that comment, oh, that person, you know, they're academic <laughs> or expert. You know, oh, they know what they're talking about. Well, do they? Well, and I don't depreciate their research because I'm a researcher myself. And yes, you do get insights. But somehow marrying it up with experience, I think, is a far higher intelligence. So in other words, if you're exploring poverty as an academic researcher, go and live on the street for a week. That will give some substance to your article. So I go on to say to want more evokes the desire of greed at a deeper level, starving, starving off poverty or well, not enough. So, yeah, they're, they're really going for it. But deep down, there's real insecurities about not, not having anything. And it could come from sh previous shocks in previous generations where we've really suffered, such as, you know, through wars and famine and what have you. So these are unhealthy distortions to our perception. All of life we see is based on perception. None of it is real, as our beliefs define what we see. I'm going to read that again. All of the life we see is based on perceptions. None of it is real, as our beliefs define what we see. If we have never questioned that box, the world remains the same. When we start to question, the world changes as you see differently. That is what is meant by when you change, the world changes. I've written that a lot in Twitter as well as my blogs. It literally changes. For me, when I stepped out of work and started to try to go it alone on my own, I found my creativity emerging. My sleeping patterns changed. <laughs> my poetry expressed my deepest feelings. My questions became more and more as I began to explore the world outside the current paradigm. I lived life on the edge financially, but made myself experience what was like facing fear or disappearing fear. I wanted to know what that was like. Was I really needing to work? Because this is a mantra. This is like, um, you know, a religion. Work is like a religion. You have to work. If you don't work, you're a failure. Is that true? Is it wrong to not work? Will I be socially isolated? I'm laughing. A loser, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> when I discovered what I discovered is my happiness increased. I never had that much money, but always seemed to have a roof over my head and enough food. I saw the basics of life as all that was important. To have no responsibilities, yes, of a mortgage, <laughs> partner or children, meant I could take a chance and explore this edge and see where it takes me. Now, I want to throw in that bit about responsibilities because that's a really powerful mantra. I've had someone say to me, you know, but I know that they see they see responsibility is really important where well, you're shouldering it because that's what we're taught. If you come from the perspective of a baby being born, these things are not inherent in our DNA. We're taught these beliefs. And that's not to say that we own our part in things. That's not to say um, if I make this mess, I don't clean it up. I do. These are common sense approaches, but we call them responsibilities. 
you have the responsibility to. It's good to question, and I probably would say as an extension to that, I'm just giving you a reflection on my own life. You have your own life experiences. For some, responsibility might be a really important thing. I've got a friend who she gives her word about something. She will never break it. She says, you know, or she feels empathy for the other. Oh, they're really sad. I'll go. And she's exhausted. I mean, that's an incredible person, really. She goes way beyond what she needs, but she does get exhausted. So as some of you who read my blog will know, it took me into the realm of being a clown. Yay, a mature woman choosing to clown. <laughs> Naturally. I'm just playing now as I go into the energy. <laughs> I like having fun and being silly. I particularly love connecting with people as I feel genuine love for them. I'm just going into the clown energy. <laughs> I do feel love for them. I don't care what they look like, their status. I just love the fact they exist for me to meet. I didn't care at all what people thought of my choices as I'm not restricted by convention. <laughs> Yay. I don't need approval to be myself. I couldn't care less if I'm a woman and have lost the chance at children. Oh, my God. I love children, and, yes, I would have loved to pet one. But you know what? My life would never have been the same. <laughs> I never saw the loss in not having children, and it doesn't mean I'm not a woman. And for those women looking at this, they often think, oh, you don't have kids. Well, you don't know what it's like for us. It doesn't matter. I know what it's like for me. I've been a child. I often say that. And I'm very childlike, so I can relate to kids actually far more. So I've lived in the moment and trusted life. I'm pioneering probably something away from the typical gender stereotypes is actually what has happened. I saw many women working 24-7 and finding life stressful. Sure, they love their children. I saw the importance of family. But in my journey, that was not perceived as important. I found myself following a thread, having no idea where I was going. The world of uncertainty was born, and this is the aliveness in life. It is not predictable. I have no idea who I meet and where I go. It's exciting and it keeps your mind alert. You don't become dull in the senses, falling into patterns as you are constantly with the change of life. Sorry, I'm just lost my track there for a second. Change of life rather than living in a false reality that appears stable. I'm going to read that again. You don't become dull on the senses, so you're not falling into these patterns. As you are constantly with the change of life rather than living in a false reality that appears stable. It's funny how Trump comes up. <laughs> false. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah, with love, of course. In truth, it is in a sea of change. But when we keep rhythms the same, sameness occurs. Most people are bored with that. You only have to look at the faces on the train and in the workplace to see they are bored, but they feel trapped to have to work this way. They have kids and responsibilities. They wait for the end of the day and retirement. This is the life for many people who are in industrialised systems. The majority don't enjoy their time here on the planet. They live for their children, so their children can have the same life. Interestingly, the interesting thought I'm saying here, yes, although deep down I am sure they feel they are working for a better life for their kids. That is how beautiful their hearts are. You know, I've stood on, I stood on the train because I don't go on it very much and I watch them all and I see them all plugged in, ignoring each other. Not just here in Australia, I've seen it everywhere I've travelled in the world. I remember the London Underground being like that. They're all isolated from one another, too scared to talk. Blows my mind. I, I do talk to people on the train, um, have a chat if I feel like it. If I don't, I might just enjoy the silence. But what I'm seeing is I'm making a choice. They're not. They're actually feeling they can't talk to people. They don't trust people. So let's go back to the core issue. We are stewards. We do not own the planet. 
This is a fundamental truth. It is not possible to own it as we pass away. Our stay on this planet is fleeting and how we treat each other and the planet has implications for those beings, human and otherwise, who come after us. That's responsibility. When you break out of the human-made world governed by television, work, social norms and home, when you venture around the world looking at the natural wonders of the earth, you feel your insignificance. It is a beautiful feeling to feel yourself in awe of the natural world. To see your proper place as part of, not in dominion over, you see you are here for a short time and that your stay is to honour what you have been given for free. I see that system of giving through my life when I have little money. People give me places to stay, food, friendship, and I find myself not needing to buy the house. As always, I stay in nice houses. I'm just lucky <laughs> this house sitting. Even if they are not, they are to me. So in other words, even if the house is not nice, it is to me. I'm grateful is what I'm saying there. I float through life rather than securing to one place and I find this dynamic world transforming before my eyes. As I see life as change and I never know what will happen, thus I have no control over it. Not dissimilar to the parachute jump from 10,000 feet where I felt myself not falling but the forces of nature rushing up to me. I felt myself completely in the moment with no control. It was freedom. Yet we are taught control is freedom, yet in truth it is bondage. Those who enforce control are those who feel subjugated to it. They are not free. When you break the fetters of fear, that is when you jump from the plane, metaphorically, and free fall. Perhaps without a shoot. <laughs> Gee, that'd be interesting. Imagine if you could do it without a shoot. <laughs> Interestingly, you allow life to be in control, and that is the natural way of it. You let go of stress, let go of force, let go of expectations, and welcome wonder, being wrong, challenges, beauty, new friendships, new experiences. And of course, I'll add to that judgment. <laughs> People judge. But in many ways, I don't mind. <clears throat> I actually don't mind. I'd be doing the same thing if I was them. All that because you chose to let go and allow life to be the master. Rather than in service to my needs, I'm beginning to serve the planet as service is natural. It is love and action. By learning to allow life to serve me and to, li and to serve life, isn't that a beautiful thought? As I awaken to this incredible experience called life, there is less and less that I need. I find myself slowly surrendering to no career, to no plans, to no partner, to little money as I surrender. I relax. As I relax, my world changes. Freedom guides my choices through impulse. And when I'm afraid, I question my thoughts. When I'm tired, I recognise imbalance. As I attempt to find harmony within myself, it translates into the planet as all life is connected. We breathe the same air that Buddha, Lao Tzu, Einstein, Jesus, Muhammad, Rumi breathed. For we are living as the one breath. All is interconnected. The cities appear separated, but in truth, they are part of the dynamic change. As the earth changes intensify, the rhythm of routine will be disrupted. A little like the glitches in the matrix, I feel. People will be forced to question, which they are now, as they are losing faith in the secure world they thought was real, to find truths emerging. The illumination of truths is occurring in alignment with the earth changes as we are entering an evolutionary shift. With this shift, our whole world will change and many will wake up. No human can stop the changes. 
as they are not human-induced. Climate change appears human-induced, and indeed pollution and imbalanced extractions from the planet have impacts on the natural system. Nature, however, is incredibly adaptable and responds to even the slightest variations. Nature is always and aware of all changes, as all is connected. See, the natural system is very sensitive. The planet is a living system, an, organ an organism, no less orbiting a central sun in space, part of a greater ecosystem of infinite universes. So our awareness is only a pinprick of the greater reality that is completely different to what we think we know. What we know is infinitesimal compared to the greater scheme of existence. I love that thought as it renders me ignorant. Egos will rise up thinking they know as they seek security and knowledge, whereas when you don't know, that is the beginning of allowance which opens to new knowledge. That is how we realise how much we don't know. I experienced that somewhat when I first went to university. As I grew in knowledge, I saw my profound ignorance. That realisation was the beginning of my own enlightenment. The less you know, the more you know, because became, sorry, I'll read that again. The less you know, the more you became aware you do not know and allow for more of what you don't know. If the mind lives in utter certainty, it does not open to possibilities. This is why we don't change. I found this true for interpersonal relationships. When you think you are right, you cannot possibly make any space in your mind for the possibility that you may not know. We then harden our positions of right and we may ignore the other, treat them disrespectfully or separate, separate from them. When we make allowances for our role, take responsibility for our part, in brackets separating from others, and choose unity, we then see our role and apologise or seek to join with the other. This is unity consciousness always seeking to return to what is termed oneness. Now, what? Getting closer to the end now, but I ask you to stay with me. When I clowned in a refugee camp in northern Thailand in a slum in Cambodia, and in a slum in Cambodia, I felt the sense of connectedness with fellow humans. The moment I saw this was because a boy chased after the vehicle that, that was taking the clown away. He and his friend ran for ages. The realisation that this was a significant moment dawned on me. I reached out the window and our hands touched. A little like God and Adam image. I might say that my previous one, <laughs> Sistine Chapel, which I've seen actually. I have to say that, that, it, that it was what it felt like. He was God, by the way. I was touching his finger. It was actually super profound, this moment that I'm conveying here. Words can never do it justice. Because I'd just been through a slum. This was Andong slum in Cambodia that I'm talking about. Myself and a Sri Lankan doctor, we were um, clowning with some children in a makeshift school that was funded by an Australian NGO. Lee Matthews was the person. She was Australian of the year, Lee. And I noted in that slum, this was not connected with her, but there was a toilet it was funded by a church and only that denomination could use it. <laughs> oh, God, couldn't believe that. Separation. Anyway, we clowned with the kids and end up being like, you know, these merry people coming through the slum, playing music, and I was juggling, and I had these fluffy um, plastic balls I was chucking at the parents, you know, in the marketplace, and they were throwing them back. So we're making a connection. But the children were right around us and there were some children, there was two in particular, that really connected. Um, this was one of them was a little boy that I touched fingers with and I ended up pulling out a puppet, just seeing if I've written about this. Don't think so. I pulled out a puppet and I gave it to the boy and he stopped because he was running after the bus. This mini, oh, it was actually a mini 
what was it? It was a little vehicle we were in. We we're heading to the airport. It was in that moment that I knew that peace was connection. That's why it's very concerning when we're seeing all this um, cyber stuff disconnecting people. Yes, people can communicate electronically, but we don't actually know each other. We're not connecting. There's safe spaces in which to communicate, but the real communication has to be face-to-face. -face. That's how we learn the most. All teaching should be face-to-face. -face. But I don't see that technology can't be used. I think it can, but as long as it's used as a tool, not as a replacement of those very important interactions. When I oh, see, I can feel the child that I connected with, very important, very important. That was actually a realisation in that moment. So I go on to say here that the Sistine Chapel idea, the fingers touching, the feeling of oneness is what I felt. So God was, when we touched, a feeling of, of oneness that he and I connected through love. He loved the clown, I loved the children. So we had our moment of reconne uh, reconnection. It was profound, and through tears I told Rota senior Rotarians in Bangkok, because I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow, that peace is connection. One of them came up to me, he goes, because I cried, he goes, you can't fake that. <laughs> but you know what, they, they didn't take on board what I said, they didn't get it, but that's okay. When you have a realisation, it's really for you. I'm just sharing it. So in truth, peace is oneness. It is where we all join as one body, one mind, one planet. You'll see some of my videos where I've talked about that. It's coming home to fundamental truth. So we do not own our beautiful planet. We are here as stewards. The economic minerals in the ground are not going to create a secure future. That is the illusion of economics that will create the security is a returning to the oneness that creates a security where we are each other's keepers, where what I do for you, I do for me. What I do for me, I do for you. So as I live the life I'm living, I'm actually doing this for you, leading by example. I'm taking a chance. But in truth, I'm stepping off a cliff into the unknown and there's rich possibilities sitting there. That's the abundance. So we do not own the planet, as I've said, nor the, mineral, the minerals on the ground are not going to give you security. We're, we're here to look after each other. I feel empowered when what I do for you, I do for me. Or what you do for you, you do for me. Think of self-improvement. The sense is that we are one. It is not selfishness, rather self-awareness. Rather than let me take as much as I can from you and feel like a winner, when in truth we are part of the one system as I take from you, I take from me. That is why we are uncomfortable about the starving millions in Africa, India and China. And I've got in brackets the later floated into my mind because a lot of impoverishment. China's massive. What is it? 1.6 billion people all different nationalities within the one. We walk past such horrific poverty, deformity and beggars, averting our eyes as we don't know what to do. The problems seem so enormous and we do not feel connection with the person begging on the street. As a clown, you do. You bend down and ask them. As I have done many times, I've told a beggar I'd been homeless and he sat with me, he joined with me and it was like respect. He respected me. I was, I was very surprised. He's saying, you're like me. Who would have thought that? They're not respecting the people with money going past. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> wow, what an insight that, that was. <laughs> he didn't respect the community as they gave, but didn't join him. I love that moment. So connection is the key. Do it with love and it will give you the greatest security that money can't buy, as our world is 
rather magical. That's why I'm a clown. Harry Potter symbolises the future in the sense that it is all magic. We are not in control and dreams can come true. What dreams may come came to my mind just then. So don't give up by 40, as Patch said, <laughs> Patch Adams. The magic is within you, within you. It's a wonderful life when you wonder at life. Enjoy your life. Face yourself. Embrace diversity and live to the fullest. As you change, your world changes. Just imagine what the world would be like if everyone chose what they love as the message of their life. Every human would indeed be living to their highest vision. It would make the great philosophers and thinkers look like child's play. Everyone is great. Patch Adams said that. When they let go of fear or step off the cliff, to not fall but fly. <laughs> I just changed that slightly. So that is my story for the moment. Connectedness is the key to peace on this planet. We are one. Question the paradigm you're living in. What is the fear that holds you into that? What is your highest vision? Is it true that you can't be the change you wish to see in the world? Is it true that you cannot make a difference? Is it true that you have no choice and no power? I say to you, you have a choice, always, and that's your power. Love will be the guide that sets all free. Tap into love, question everything, and go with what feels right. That is how you move towards making peace with your world and world peace. Bye.